Hey, I'm James from Smoking Dad Barbecue, and today we are settling a family feud. We've got two completely different concepts that come in under $500 to find out which offers the best bang for our baby backs. Let's get into it. So I am really looking forward to today's comparison because we really have a crossover battle. There's some similarities, some, some differences. At the end of the day, it's all part of one great family since Masterbuilt, Kamado Joe, and Char Griller all became part of one extended family earlier this year. And I wanna put the different design concepts head to head and see what you can actually taste or you can't taste when it comes to producing great barbecue. Earlier this year, I bought a Kamado Joe Series 1, and I was blown away at how little difference there is, especially considering the price between a Series 1, the oldest Kamado Joe Big Joe, versus the Series 3. Sure, there's absolutely differences in things you can appreciate, but for less than half the price, it's a, a pretty compelling value proposition. So in Team Kamado, we have a kettle style grill that is uh, trying to cross over with a little bit of Kamado properties where we've got a ceramic firebox as well as the slow roller. And then in Team Char Griller, we have traditional kettle properties, uh, but acting more like a Kamado. So we've got double walled uh, metal insulation that will help uh, create the same type of high efficiency, low charcoal fuel burn uh, that you can get in a Kamado. So we're gonna put uh, a kettle acting like a Kamado and a Kamado acting a bit like a kettle head to head and find out what makes the best baby back ribs. So without further ado, let's get our seasoning on our ribs and start our fires and get this show on the road. Okay, so we're gonna do a bit of a deconstructed rub today. It sounds really fancy. It just means we're not mixing any of our components together uh, ahead of time. And so if you had the chance to dry brine these overnight, that's something that I'd absolutely recommend. But since we are just bringing these home and cooking them same day, there hasn't been time to do the overnight salt dry brine with something like Diamond Crystal Kosher Salt. If we were gonna do that, that would just mean putting a coating of rub on it exactly as if you would season no more no less and leave them on a rack like this in the refrigerator overnight. So just to get ready, I'm gonna take my uh, pepper can in and grind up some fresh cracked black pepper. So we have that and then we'll be able to sprinkle that everywhere. So take you fast forward while we get some pepper going. Okay, that should be plenty. I think that looks good. We'll set that aside. Uh, so I've got a bit of a mustard for a binder. You don't need to use a binder. And if I was dry brining, I often wouldn't do that, but I'm really just going for the mustard for a little bit of the sugars. Uh, if you weren't gonna use mustard, maybe add a little sugar to your rub. Uh, but if you've got sugar in your rub and mustard, sometimes I find that can burn and you get the crispy black bits before you've got your bark completely set. So we've got mustard uh, that we'll put down. Then we're gonna do our salt and pepper. And then we'll add a layer of garlic, a little bit of onion, and then some uh, paprika just to finish that off. I'll take you fast forward while we get to work on the membrane. So to do that, I've just got a kitchen knife and some paper towel to help me grab so that we can flip these over, find where the membrane is, use the paper towel and rip that off. And we'll start applying all of our seasoning. A Little bit of our pepper. Fresh cracked is, uh, is worth doing by the way if you can get a pepper grinder or a coffee mill that will make a big difference in your rubs you can absolutely taste that versus stuff that has been packaged and maybe sitting on the shelf for a long time while i've got you here we'll add a little bit of garlic onion paprika and then we'll flip everything and do the exact same thing on our presentation side I mentioned presentation side i'm starting bone side down uh, as this is not going to be what we want to look pretty and so i don't want to get it all looking nice and then flip it and have some of that fall off onto our tray which is why i'm starting bone side down see you once i got these ready Okay, these look great. So as you can tell, we've got our rub on there, but I haven't absolutely just caked it on. If you go way too thick and you go to slice into these, you'll have what looks like a good bark and it will just completely slide off. So what we want with going with the deconstructed rub is to get layers, a little bit of sweet from those sugars as they caramelize from the mustard, the savory from our garlic and our onion, the salt and pepper, just you know, giving you a little bit of spice as well as highlighting the flavor of these uh, pork ribs themselves and the paprika well that one's just for color to give us a nice mahogany color let's let these sweat out a little bit while they do that we can go fire up our pits <laughs> so 
So to make this as fair as possible, a fair fight, I wanna keep the variables or new things that we're trying down to a minimum so that we have the best opportunity to actually pick up on any of the differences in the taste of our food from the two cookers themselves. So I'm using Fogo Super Premium Charcoal in both, which my family happens to prefer as that tastes more like wood that you would get on an offset. It's still charcoal, but it's closer to the spectrum of wood flavor than it is a charcoal flavor. Similarly for our smoking wood, I'd be tempted on ribs to go for something a little bit bolder, like hickory, mesquite, or even cherry wood goes great with pork, but I'm sticking with pecan today as my three chunks, as that again is much lower on the smoke scale. And that'll help me understand, you know, the difference of maybe the kettle joe and the slow roller uh, coming into play or my I worry, you know, with a really insulated grill uh, that doesn't need to burn a lot of fire, that that might sort of taste a little bit dirtier. So I want to keep the variables to the point where I can tell the difference between the grills versus anything else that we're doing setup wise in between them. I mentioned the three smoking chunks. I would normally do about, you know, 95% charcoal to 5% smoking wood. Anywhere in that ratio is fine. But I actually want to sort of test again the energy efficiency. And so one of the things I love doing, particularly in my normal Kamados, is put either wood chips or wood pellets in the bottom ash drawer. As the charcoal burns, those hot embers will fall down, combust. And this is a great way to keep smoke rolling through a, a longer cook, whether it be ribs, pulled pork, or brisket. Especially Especially since in a normal Kamado style grill, there's not an easy way to get down and access the fire and add more smoking wood. So by placing a wood chunk in the bottom of the kettle joe as well as the acorn, this will give me a chance to see how much coals is burning down. Uh, the, again, the hotter, cleaner the fire, the more uh, coals that we should have falling down that will combust those two pieces of wood. And I picked as even as I can as far as wood chunks go so that at the end of the test, we can come back and see how that's uh, performed. The next two chunks, I'm gonna place on the bottom of the uh, charcoal basket. You can place them anywhere, wood will burn, but I like the bottom for a couple reasons. If you place the smoking wood on the top or on the sides, this tends to cause a lot of trouble when it comes to controlling your temperatures. So maybe you've got the charcoal going, you think your temperatures are steady, and then all of a sudden that piece of wood combusts and it'll shoot your temperatures up. And often what people do in this situation is uh, over adjust their vents, and then eventually you're in a yo-yo of chasing your temperatures your entire cook, and that's no fun. Uh, and so to help prevent that, uh, we can put the charcoal down below as it will burn far more predictably with all that charcoal on top of it. The second benefit, and I'm not sure you know, scientifically if this is true, but I 100% can validate it from personal experience, is the smoke going through the burning charcoal acts like a bit of a purifier. You want your smoke in that four to 600 degree Fahrenheit range. You don't want just smoldering wood at you know 100 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, as that is really just putting off creosote. So by having that wood smolder underneath the fire and act a fire and go up past that fire, it tends to act like a purifier and it tastes and smells better. And so that's good enough. Uh, for me and our family as I notice a remarkable improvement, not only in temperature control, but also smoke quality, which is why if I've not explained it before and you've been around for a previous video, I like to bury my wood chunks at the bottom. And it's not just me, uh, famous and world champion pit masters like Harry Sue also say the same when cooking in kettles or Kamado style grills. So we are in good company with finding that this tip works great. So all we have to do now is wait for our two grills to come up to temperature. I'm gonna be targeting 350 or sorry, 300 degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, for today's cook. So I'll rejoin you once we're stable at 300, not 350 in a couple minutes and we'll get our baby backs on each grill. Okay, both grills are up and stable at about 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And so I've gone for a similar approach with each one where I'm taking the bottom dampers on the acorn down to one finger width, as well as on the kettle joe, both at one finger width. If you've never heard the analogy before, I like to think of our vents or our dampers a little bit like gas and brake. So the bottom is our gas pedal. You open it all the way up and you are wide open throttle trying to draw in as much air as possible. The top is like our brake and so a setup that doesn't make a lot of sense is to be wide open on the bottom, maximum gas, and then just a little bit of break on the top. Because tends, uh, what tends to happen here is when you open your dome to spray your ribs, now you have a, a rush 
of air and that tends to help the fire accelerate and run away a little bit more quickly. It can also be subject to backdrafting, which is if you ever see smoke coming out of your bottom draft door, which we're not getting on either grill, uh, that can also happen um, when you've got that all the way open and the, <laughs> the fire can actually reverse flow where it's drawing in air up top and exhausting uh, out the bottom. And again, in a smoker, we wanna get that nice clean smoke coming up past our food. We don't want it being drawn out the bottom. And the third uh, reason that I love doing this is it's a little bit like, uh, or it helps us control wind changes in temperature and wind. And so we're out here, there's occasionally a nice gust or a breeze and so if we have that all the way open uh, that helps uh, you know the wind have more of an impact on our cook and we can neutralize that by going with less air on the bottom uh, and instead controlling that with our brake uh, up top. So now that we've got our two grills steady and holding 300 degrees Fahrenheit, dare I say I try the hand test, which is normally how I like to confirm that we're up to temperature. This is still a Kamado, so I think I should be okay. Yep, no, I can hold my hand on there without getting scolded and even just standing near here, I think I'll do this one really quick. Yeah, as you surprised, I'm not putting my hand on that because the kettle doesn't have the same R value that you would get in a Kamado where uh, you get that nice warm feeling is what it should feel like on a classic or a Big Joe or even the Acorn where I can hold my hand there for about three seconds and you think that's about enough. So no surprise on the hand test, but we are ready to get our ribs on. So let me go grab them, meet you at the grill. So one of the things that impressed me as I was setting up the Acorn is that you get features like the latch, which is something you find on the classic 2, 3, or Big Joe 2, 3, as well as this high heat grade uh, mesh gasket, which is really gonna provide a uh, good seals. So that was definitely a nice feature. So let's get our first set of baby backs. And I'm just gonna try and go for a front back configuration here. The grill size on the Acorn is a little bit smaller than it is on the Kettle Joe. So we're about 20 inches in uh, diameter. So it's just a little bit bigger than the Classic, which is 18 inches. Big Joe's 24 and the Kettle Joe is 22. So we're a little bit all over on size, but plenty of room. Uh, we'd probably do three racks of ribs, no problem here. The only issue we would have is on the plates that are similar to one of the complaints I had about the big green egg when this is the only option is with the tripod configuration, there's no good way to be 100% protected for all your racks of ribs. So by having the leg at the back, that is giving me the largest direct zone, which is why I've gone front to back, trying to stay within the protection of the deflector. Let's close this up. Okay, the Kettle Joe we're using is the Kamado Joe slow roller, so I can place these ribs either which way, and it shouldn't really matter, but to keep things as even as possible, I'll do the same front to back configuration. And as I was mentioning on the Acorn, uh, this is a 22 inch grill versus a 20 inch grill, but you can really barely see that difference uh, in terms of the uh, space being occupied by the rack of ribs. I think the same three racks of ribs would be what fits comfortably here. So once again, let's close this up. And I should mention, if you haven't seen my Kettle Joe modification video, I have added some felt to help reduce the amount of smoke leaking. Even with this, uh, I still get a little bit of smoke leak, but it's significantly cut down on the amount of smoke that escapes and more importantly, grease that runs out the front. So we are just an hour into this cook and there is already some really interesting differences going on with our two grills. So once we added our ribs, which is normal that when you add cold ribs into a hot grill, you see a bit of a change in the temperature. Plus it's just more time that the grill has been burning and you really get it locked into temperature. So I've made some adjustments to our vents, but on our char griller acorn, I'm down to nearly a half finger width on the bottom draft door and maybe just about a quarter of an inch open. And I'm just below the number one setting on the control tower top in order to maintain um, it looks like about 280 degrees Fahrenheit on the temperature gauge. On the Kamado Joe Kettle Joe, I haven't had to adjust the bottom vent and I do have a bit more uh, you know, experience with this one. So no surprise that the, the vent ended up close to where I thought it would be. This is my first rib cook. Uh, but similarly to the Acorn, when you add cool ribs, you get that cooling effect. This definitely impacts the Kettle Joe 
more than it does the acorn as the cool ribs just help cool off that ambient temperature and it doesn't have the uh, r value to maintain that heat in the dome and so i did have to end up bumping up the top vent a little bit more to continue holding uh, a very similar looking 280 degrees fahrenheit but even just sitting here uh, and seeing sort of the smoke the sounds and the amount of air that you can see moving out of our control tower top on the kettle joe versus on the acorn next to nothing I think is already a, a real life example of what we were talking about in terms of the amount of air that is being moved through the kettle joe and how that often results in good flavor since uh, we don't get any of that residual value we have to burn a hot fire and we're losing heat out the base we're losing heat out those smoke leaks on the side uh, and we're losing heat out the dome and so that's often why again you just burn that much more fuel in a kettle than you do in a Komodo we're not throwing any uh, white flags at this point in terms of what's actually going to taste better but just fascinating to see these two different philosophies play out real time so since it's an hour in let's come nice and close take a look for the first time and get some spray for spray i'm going to use apple cider vinegar uh 50 diluted with water 50 percent. let's get some spray all right let's start with our kettle joe Woo. one hour in those are already looking good getting some nice smoke color so I'm just gonna spray all sides, make sure nothing's drying out. And by spraying in the first hour, this will also just help any smoke that we are get uh, that we are getting adhere to the meat. Let's do the same thing on the charcoal. All right, let's take a look. So definitely getting some more well done on the ends outside of our plate setter, so I can see the bone starting to pull, which I didn't notice in the kettle joe so that's interesting that we're getting some bone pull on the ends everything looks pretty even all the way through definitely need some spray on each end and then uh, looking a little bit more uh, behind in the middle so let's get some spray close that back up and we'll check again in another hour okay we are two hours in and i think it's time to move our ribs into the foil boat now you can do a bunch of things but i like the foil boat on both these style grills for a couple of reasons we could do a full foil wrap but that'll tend to give you fall off the bone texture it'd be a little bit more like we braise the ribs or cook them in a slow pot or an instant pot or a crock pot <laughs> i'll get the word right eventually style cooker and that's just not uh, my favorite style of rib we could wrap them in paper so that will help accelerate the cook but on a Kamado style grill where the heat is coming up from the bottom, often our bark on the top, especially only after two hours, it could take a little bit more. And so the foil bow uh, works really well in uh, on ribs as well as on brisket on a Kamado style cooker where we have the heat coming up from the bottom so we can protect from the bottom. We get some of that insulation like you know putting on a sweater or a warm blanket to keep you a little bit warmer, uh, which will increase uh, or accelerate our cook time so that we're not waiting too long. But it'll also allow the top of our baby backs to be exposed to that smoke for a little bit longer for this next hour uh, and help firm up that bark and just make sure it's exactly what we want for a presentation. So I think it's the best of all worlds combined. So let's check them out and get them into a boat. Cruising along at 300. And those are looking really good. So we are getting a little bit more done here on each of the end, but that's really just because of the plate setter. It doesn't give us end to end coverage. So our two areas where we are just sticking outside of the safety net of the plate setter below look a little bit more done than everything else, but we're getting good pullback here for two hours in. These are looking really good. The color's catching up least on that side and over here is actually looking a little better too. So I think another hour exposed, those will look great. Let's go check on the Kettle Joe. Again, still cruising along right at 300. Oh, that's looking good. So we are getting a really nice looking bark, but there is actually not as much pullback on these bones as there is on the char griller. So just starting to get a little bit of that here. So let's get these off, get them in the foil. Okay, let's start with our Kettle Joe ribs. So I've just double uh, laid down two pieces of foil and started to fold them together. And all we're gonna do for the boat is roll it up as tight as we can without coming up and over the edges. Take a fast forward while we make our boat. That looks good. And now same thing with the char griller acorn. And the reason I'm doing two pieces of foil 
as we're starting to get our bones poking out here, I don't want any of those to pop through. Nice little boaties. Let's get them on. Okay, it's three hours on the dot. And if you can see behind me, I've just taken off our ribs and are gonna let them rest for a few minutes. So A, we can touch them as well as just give them a chance to stop pushing out some of that juice and start to recollect it. So we got a nice juicy bite. So I'm gonna do that outside, nice and warm. So they're not gonna cool off too quick. It's gonna give us an opportunity though, to go look at our smoke tray. So we added a chunk of wood in the bottom of each as well as inside the grill. So let's take a look and see how each did at burning the wood that we placed in the bottom. All right, let's check out our kettle, Joe. Get this out here. A couple pieces of coal. So that has completely consumed our smoking wood and I don't see any evidence of it in there. So that is completely gone. So that's burned up well. So that means we're getting lots of charcoal burning down and hot embers landing on that. And that's burned an entire piece of wood. Let's go check the acorn. So the acorn has uh, the same high heat gasket material right here. I don't know if you can see that, that um, this bottom ash catcher tray hangs on to. So I'll just unlatch that. There we go. And it's got a hanging thing. So it's not like it's gonna drop right out, but let's take a peek. And we still have what looks like a pretty fresh piece of smoking wood. So that has not burned at all. Even though I think we added a little bit more, that's really not burned. Let's take a look inside the grill. Okay, start with the acorn here. Just get our cooking grate out, our deflector plate. Move that down so you can see a little bit. So we still have lots of charcoal left. I don't see, oh, there's a little bit, one piece of our smoking wood still here. So that's broken off. In fact, this might even be, yep, that is, that's our smoking wood piece here. So you can see it is actually still smoldering away. Uh, but the other piece looks to be gone. So we've not used all of our chalk, our charcoal, but the smoking wood in the bottom is still intact as are a couple of those chunks. Let me put everything back so it doesn't melt through the bottom of the tray. All right, checking out the kettle, Joe. Just remove our slow roller here and get our tool and checking around. And I would just say, even just visually, I tried to add similar amounts of charcoal, but it looks like we have, as expected, burned through a little bit more in the kettle joe, which again, you would expect, we're not getting the insulation. And I don't see any sign of our smoking wood chunks here on the bottom, just like we couldn't find in the ash drawer. I think those have been completely burnt up. Now for the best part, let's go see if you can taste any of that. All right, these look and smell amazing and I can't wait to dive in for our taste test. I was pretty surprised uh, and yet also not surprised to see the difference just that close and not personal in terms of how much wood uh, was burned versus not being burned. But does any of that matter? They look, they smell identical. So let's see if that can show up in our taste test or not. So on my left here is the acorn. So I've kept everything in the same uh, order. And on my right, your left is the kettle joe. So let's come nice and close, slice them up and dive in for our taste test. So I've deliberately not sauced the ribs so that we don't have any extra variables like the taste of the sauce or the simple syrup uh, throwing us for a loop. So that's why I didn't explain that earlier. Uh, we haven't opted for any sauce. So let's take a look here at our acorn rib. So it looks good. Not a ton of smoke ring, but that looks incredibly juicy. So I think that's gonna be a good bite. Let's cut open our Kamado Joe Kettle Joe ribs here. Get a couple, same out of the midsection. Okay, so let's take a look. So just visually there, you can see the smoke ring difference. Now you can't really taste the smoke ring, but you do eat with your eyes. And just right there, there is a pretty big difference in color. Let's see if we can taste that. Okay, starting with the acorn, the first one that we cut up, let's take a bite. Mm. Not fall off the bone, but no effort whatsoever to bite through. I mean, it's a good rib. I don't know if you're able to tell or not, but super clean when you bite, no tug. Perfect, perfect consistency. 
I know I've been standing in the smoke, so I'll be less susceptible to it than others, but not a lot of smoke. It's still a very good rib. I still take that any day over a restaurant. Mm. That was good. Okay, so let's jump to our Kamado Joe Kettle Joe rib. And again, as I was cutting, I could tell the difference in just the heat deflectors. The uh, Char Griller Acorn with the heat deflector is able to cut through no problem. Whereas we're a little bit crispier on the bottom here on the Kettle Joe. So maybe I should have moved it to the foil boat earlier. No problem, but uh, just getting on the edge of, or sort of the maximum edge of doneness. Let's take a bite. Mm. Same doneness, same bite through. Oh, good. So two amazing ribs. And despite visually being able to tell, uh, this one is the Kettle Joe uh, ring with the smoke versus the acorn. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not picking up any difference. Again, I would be the least likely to be able to do that standing out in the smoke, but normally doing lots of these experiments, there's normally one that strikes at least something a little different. So I'm gonna go for round number two, we'll see if we can pick it up, maybe it was just the one cut. But right now, I'm calling this a tie for taste. So let's do one more, our, our acorn here. So rib number two has helped. Now we are really, really, really thin, but there is, there is a bit more smoke on this. I thought the second time I had this, this was juicier, the next rib, the bite, I would, you know, kind of cancel that out. It was dead equal. But it's after you sort of, you know, swallow the aftertaste in your mouth where you can taste that smoke or a clean smoke sort of standing out. And I am definitely picking up, you know, a little bit more. Now, is that the only reason to, you know, sort of decide between these two? I would want to consider a bunch of other things. You know, on the Kettle Joe, the slow roller has turned out this great result, but even just picking it up to set it down, I didn't show you here, but I got some grease stains on my deck that I'm gonna have to pick up. So that slow roller removing, um, you know, you definitely get a little bit of that, uh, which is what you need to do if you wanna change from a low and slow configuration to hot and fast. So it's versatile, but with nowhere to store the slow roller, that is still a bit of a drawback. On the acorn, uh, if I had grease on the stone, the same thing would happen. So it's not like it's uh, gonna be subject to that, but you don't need to go through any of that to switch from low and slow to hot and fast. You can configure just like we do with our Kamado with a dividing tier uh, system or put a half stone or something like that in there, which is not included all aftermarket accessories, but you could treat that exactly the way that I do on my Big Joe or Classic Joe or any other videos you know, on the channel. And so for the taste test here, I'm gonna say yeah, it's inconclusive. If I was only cooking ribs or brisket, I think I'd rather have the Kettle Joe just based on the look and the smoke. But for the sort of versatility of switching between low and slow and being one size fits all, you definitely get the jack of all trades functionality. It's a, despite being made out of metal, that's a real Kamado. And if you're on the fence, do I want to jump in the journey and go all the way and get a Kamado that'll last me a lifetime? This is more representative of the Kamado experience. Uh, albeit, I don't have as much trouble burning wood inside of either of my Joes, whether it's wood on the bottom ash drawer, I've done full chunks to chips, to pellets, and so I'll have to do a test. Let me know if you'd like to see that in the comments, or maybe we load these up, even though they're all you know, different sizes, with an equal amount of charcoal and see how long they can hold temperature and burn. Uh, but my suspicions here is that the acorn is the most fuel efficient of them all, which is what uh, we are seeing and tasting here in terms of the lack of smoke ring or the lack of smoke flavor uh, and the most amount of charcoal remaining and the least amount of wood actually burnt up during the cook. Now, that's a good thing if you don't want to be burning a lot of charcoal, uh, you know, every single week just to, you know, make some great barbecue. But for me, <laughs> I'm, I'm going down with the ball of flames because it tastes absolutely amazing and uses much fuel as I can. This has been really interesting. Let me know what you'd like to see down in the comments. And if you don't want to buy a grill of any kind, you want to win one, all you have to do is subscribe. I'm nearing 100,000 subscribers. When I pass 100K, I'm going to do a draw and give away a brand new Kamado Joe Classic Series 2 along with a bunch of goodies to a lucky subscriber. So if you haven't already, make sure you hit subscribe. And while you're down there, be sure to check out the members only section where I go live once a month with members and we can interact in a little bit more one-on-one -on -one setting than these pre-recorded videos. That's it for today though. I'm James from Smoking Dead Barbecue signing off. Remember, don't be afraid to fire it up. Ooh. Yep. Mm-hmm.